Welcome everyone to Axterra's third and final lecture for our fall 2020 series. This lecture is titled Creating Carbon Rich Soil is the Next Generation Solution to the Climate Crisis. My name is Robbie Brown. I'm the Community Engagement Associate for Actera. Before we, we begin, just a few Zoom logistics. Your webcam and microphone are deactivated for this webinar. Um, However, we will be having a Q&A portion towards the end of this event. If you would like to submit a question to one of our keynote speakers, please be sure to do so by using the Q&A tab and not the chat box. So the Q&A tab is located near the chat box. Simply click it and a pop-up will appear on your screen. You can type in your question and submit it and we will see it here on our end. I can't guarantee we'll get to everyone's question today, but we certainly will try. You're also able to upvote questions. So if there's one particular question that you really wanna make sure that we get to, please be sure to upvote it. So Actera is an environmental nonprofit based in the Bay Area. We are driven by environmental problems occurring locally and globally, and primarily the problems that have resulted due to climate change. We like to engage our local communities, companies, and agencies in the Bay Area with a focus on Santa Clara and San Mateo counties. We have a wide variety of programming under the categories of electrification, food sustainability, workplace sustainability, and education. For our education component, uh, we have our public lecture series, just like the one you're at today. And for our lecture series, we like to invite leading voices from academia, business, and policy to discuss global climate change issues. Actera does not endorse or support the expressed opinions of any of our speakers. Our aim is merely to present a diverse range of views to help advance these conversations and to allow deeper reflections on challenging issues. Next, I would like to thank our series underwriters, Marion Clinton Gilliland and Armand and Elian Nukermans, as well as our series sponsors, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District and the Foster in Palo Alto. We have a lot of events that we will be announcing soon for January. However, I can't talk about them yet, but we do have one that we can talk about, and that is our EV Financial Incentives Clinic. This is gonna be in English and in Spanish on January 21st at 7 p.m. This is a free event. If you attend this event, you'll learn about the many financial assistance programs that can make vehicle ownership a reality for you and your family. And we're not talking about just any vehicle, we're talking about a non-polluting, low-maintenance electric vehicle. So if you're interested in attending this event, you can go into Actera's website and go to the events tab and find the registration link there. We're also excited to announce our new uh, My Healthy Play, Our Healthy Planet online community. This is a space for like-minded individuals interested in food sustainability, plant-based eating, and um, food waste. This is a space where you can share recipes, photos of the meals that you've cooked, any resources, share local plant-based events that are coming up, and so forth. Uh, we will be sending you an invitation to join if you're interested in our follow-up email. And last but not least, we're excited to announce that we're going to have a, uh, a challenge coming up in January called Veganuary Your Way 2021. Uh, we challenge you to go plant forward in the new year. And with this challenge, you can approach it at your own comfort level. So you choose your own path for this January challenge, whether it's eating plant-based once a day, once a week, every day, or somewhere in between. We all have a part to play in shaping a sustainable future. We hope that you will join us in January by making changes to your diet for a healthier you and a healthier plant. Now we're gonna to get to the fun part of this event. Um, I'm gonna hand it off to our keynote speakers, our heirs to our Oceans Youth Leaders, Latifa, Dakota, and Miguel, and then our moderator, Natalie. Thank you guys for joining us today. Please feel free to take it away. Thank you, Robbie, for that great introduction. I'm looking forward to January. <laughs> I am uh, Natalie Yudo. I'm the moderator, your moderator today, and I am super excited to have this opportunity to moderate this panel of impressive global leaders. The Air to Our Oceans cause is very near to my heart, uh, both the ocean conservationism side, uh, since I've been a scuba diver for, for over 20 years, and I've personally seen the impact uh, what we do on the land has, what is happening on the Neath the waters, as well as the topic we're discussing today. I uh, live in California and uh, I'm a member of a local farm CSA uh, that is uh, having a lot of his regenerated farming ideas they use themselves. So I'm very much looking forward to the topic of today. Um, 
So for no further ado, let me introduce our panelists so we can get to the heart of the matter and talk about regenerative agriculture for the climate communities and our environment. First, we have Lativa Nansubuga. Uh, she is an 18 year old powerhouse from Kampala, Uganda. Yay, and Lativa, uh, Africa and is a climate and girls activist. She's a girl leader, a leader with Rhythm of Life, an organization in Uganda to empower girls. And in September 2018, Lativa was honored by, to have a joint plan international to the UN General Assembly as a girl advocate for Uganda. She's also a member of the Girls Advocacy Alliance, both in Uganda and globally, and of course, of Airsoft to Our Ocean. Um, and uh, you will hear from her today. Our second panelist uh, is close to where I live, uh, Miguel Mendez. He is 16 year old and was raised on a cattle ranch in the Latinx community of uh, Pescadero, which is in Northern California. And he has personally, or is personally, experiencing the impact of the destructive agriculture ways that we have in his community and he will tell us about it. He uses a courageous voice to amplify the needs of the community and drive change there. He's been a member of Airs to Our Oceans since 2017 and he co-leads the chapter in Pascadero uh, and is also part of the San Francisco Bay Area Leadership Council for Airs to Our Oceans. So very much looking forward to hear from uh, Miguel later. Then, last but not least, Dakota Peebler. She uh, is one of the founders. Four and, a half years, uh, four and a half years ago, at the age of 10, she founded Heirs to Our Oceans together with her sister and her family because she feels strongly that we need to protect our environment for future generations who are included. And she also believes that marine protected areas must take into account what happens on the land? Because what happens on the land, you know, ends up in our ocean and affects our oceans um, ecosystems uh, to the worse. So how humans grow their food is the number one threat to clean and healthy waterways, not just our oceans, but also the waterways throughout in our lakes. Um, she speaks internationally and locally uh, about these topics. And you should check her out because for her 15th birthday, a few uh, months ago, she presented on TEDx Marin uh, in a talk entitled, uh, All I Want for My Birthday is to Kill Earth Day. So that should uh, get your interest. So check it out on TED.com. But today we are gonna talk about regenerative agriculture and Dakota is going to start. Dakota. Thank you so much, Natalie. Uh, as she mentioned, my name is Dakota Peebler. I'm a co-founder of Airstore Oceans, and I am so, so very excited to be speaking to you all today. Thank you so much to Actera for having us. Um, if I could get my slides up really fast. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, I just wanted to give you all a little bit of knowledge about Airs for Oceans and who we are and what we do. So it's a global, not youth-led um, nonprofit organization that works to educate, connect, and empower youth around the world in ocean and water protection and in climate action. And next slide, please. Something that we feel is really important in, in understanding is the fact that we share this planet and no matter where we live, we're all connected by this one ocean. And the only way that we're going to be able to, to fight the crises that we're facing is through global connection and a global community of youth and adults working together. We also believe that education is incredibly, incredibly important. And so we supplement education for youth around the world with ocean and water literacy, climate literacy, technology use for storytelling, science of human impacts, and really looking at the intersectionality of crises. And in this education um, world, we focus on developing skills in creative thinking, problem solving and design thinking, empathetic leadership, critical thinking, public speaking and presenting skills, storytelling and policy advocacy. 
And there's a lot of methods in which we engage youth because we find that so, so important in the empowerment. Uh, and some of this is supporting AIRS chapters that are occurring globally, providing opportunities for youth to get their voices out there and share their incredible stories, um, organizing youth advisory councils that are extremely important, and organizing youth leadership summits. And one that we host uh, every year is our Summit for Empowerment, Action, and Leadership. This one was in SEAL, this was SEAL 2019 in Pescadero, where 40 youth from many, many different countries around the world came together in California to learn about the issues and to connect globally. But 2020, this year, we were not able to come together, of course, so we held a virtual Summit for Empowerment, Action, and Leadership where over 40 youth and 20 crew members um, from around the world came together for a six weeks intensive where they connected and developed skills in, in empathetic leadership and connection and communication and then learned and remotely created films together that got submitted to Film Fest and some won awards. And from our summit, summits from empowerment, action and leadership, youth get riled up and are so excited and so empowered and go from these, these leadership summits onto incredible, incredible work like the Children versus climate, the Climate Crisis, where five youth from our Summit for Empowerment, Action and Leadership and 10 overall heirs were part of it and petitioned the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child alongside Greta Thunberg. We also hold initiatives and a big one that we're really going to focus on today is our regenerative agriculture uh, slash tradi tradi traditional ecological farming initiative. And I want to get into what this initiative intends to solve. And that is a problem of dirt and the climate crisis. So today, most people think that dirt is just dirt, but that is very much far from the truth. Dirt is actually just deteriorated or eroded soil. But when soil is healthy and full of microorganisms, it does incredible things for us and all life on the planet. Of course, soil gives us plants, it gives us food, but it also mitigates the climate crisis by drawing down carbon from our atmosphere through plants and decaying living materials and packs it down under our feet. But our soil is under attack and it is quickly becoming dirt. So how is this happening? Why is this happening? Well, it's mainly due to poor soil management processes, one of which being monoculture. So monoculture is the planting of only one type of crop, as you can see in this picture, um, and especially over large areas. And it's incredibly unnatural and results in a lack of essential biodiversity, causing plants to be less resilient to diseases and other threats. Another huge problem that a lot of you have probably heard about is the meat and dairy industry, where intensive animal farming takes place on feedlots, affecting biodiversity and generating massive amounts of greenhouse gases, such as methane and carbon dioxide. But one of the worst problems about harmful agricultural practices is that it's often a cycle of repeated destruction on our soil, turning it into dirt. I wanna go over uh, an example of one of these harmful cycles. So let's start with tillage. Tilling land is done between planting crops to prevent the growth of weeds. And it basically stresses and destroys the soil. It creates erosion and the, the carbon that was once stored in the soil becomes released into our atmosphere due to tillage. But tilling also destroys the pore, the pore spaces in soil that are critical for water infiltration. So now when um, these crops are watered, the soil can't properly absorb it. So it's resting at the surface. So now farmers have to go and implement tile drainage systems. Tile drainage systems are costly and um, are expensive. And these tile drainage systems destroy the soil aggregates. The soil aggregates are what holds the soil together. So now we have the topsoil running off into watersheds along with the added nutrients like chemical fertilizers. Now we have this added issue of 
these chemical fertilizers running off into waterways, running down into our groundwater, which is a source of drinking water for many people. But because they have this loss of their nutrients, these farmers are adding more chemical fertilizers. This, as I just said, has an incredible threat on our planet and wreaks havoc on marine ecosystems, resulting in harmful algal blooms and eventually hypoxic zones. But these chemical fertilizers also cause more weeds to grow. So then farmers are using more tilling and that starts a cycle again, but also have to use an abundance of herbicides to kill off these um, weeds. But this herbicides not only kills off the soil microbiology, but also makes the plants more uh, susceptible to diseases. That's where the fungicides come in. So now farmers are spraying fungicides on their crops and this kills the soil microorganisms and affects the plant as it is a toxin and runs off into our waterways. So this cycle continues and continues. And not only does it put stress on our soil, on our environment, but it's also stressful and taxing on the farmers who use those practices. And so it goes, the industrial agricultural cycle is repeated and it creates massive problems that my generation are going to inherit. So as our soils turn to dust and dirt, it is no longer able to draw down carbon. Instead, it's releasing carbon back into our atmosphere. So we're turning a potential solution into the problem. Next slide, please. So as you can see here, based upon our current emissions, we are well on our way to an average global temperature that is not safe nor habitable for my children's and my future's world. Worst, the latest science involving an international study which results released this year shows that humans have well surpassed the option of trying to achieve a 1.5 degrees Celsius increase in average global temperature. Rather, the lowest increase we can strive for at this point is 2.3 degrees Celsius, an increase at the lowest end of the range of realities. So the climate crisis situation is extremely serious for my generation for all generations at this point. As we are the humans who have between 70 to 90 more years on this planet, and we are very concerned about our future and our children's futures, we have absolutely everything at stake and no time to wait. So what is yet another problem that people have to face due to industrialized agriculture? I'd like to pass it off to Miguel to share his experience. Hello everyone, my name is Miguel Mendez. I'm 17 years old and I attend Pescadero High School. As you can see in the picture, Pescadero is a small agricultural town of the coast of California and an abundance of food is grown here because so much of its land is used for, the, for agriculture. There are some small farms in, that are organic in Pescadero, but there are also, some, also many in and around Pescadero that use industrialized farming practices, including chemical fertilizers. The farmers using the chemical fertilizers do so without knowing the consequences of the chemical fertilizer. It affects both our oceans and the community in a long-term situation. Unfortunately, the Pescadero community suffers from poisoned drinking water due to the nitrates from chemical fertilizers that are used in agriculture and running into our groundwater and surface water. This is especially bad in the outskirts of town. My classmate used to live in a home where it had poison water. They sometimes couldn't shower with the water, so they were forced to rely upon refillable water bottles. And our schools also haven't had portable water for about 10 years. And visiting sports teams arrive and wonder why they cannot drink the water from the water fountain. And you'll see this, this piece of paper taped to the wall or near a water fountain that says, water is not portable, please do not drink tap water. Thank you. And that has forced our community for many years to rely upon single use plastic water bottles and Pescadero does not have a recycling facility. So plastic pollution has increased due to this situation. This is not only a problem for the ocean and sea mammals, but also health issue for humans. 
we have human rights and access to clean and healthy water should be a human right. But we don't have access to potable water right here in Northern California, and that's not right. Now, Latifa will talk to you guys more about this. Now I'm gonna hand it over to my friend Latifa. Hello, everyone. My name is Nasu Bugali de Latifa. Amanya gang bampita Nasu Bugali de Latifa. Ino Kampala, Uganda. Ino Kampala, Uganda, Mo Africa. Hello, everyone. My name is Nasu Bugali de Latifa. Has earlier on mentioned, I come from Kampala, Uganda. As you can see, this is Kampala in Uganda, and this is my good Uganda in Africa. As we all understand, the climate crisis is causing unpredictable and extreme weather. Farmers cannot predict when to plant nor harvest. Further, with the several droughts and flooding, even erosion, and practices that are against nature, such as monoculture, big tilling machinery, and chemical treatment. Because these crops are already weakened, they cannot withstand strong weather. So they end up eroding with weather has, such as floods. This is our situation here in Uganda and across Africa. This causes food insecurities leading to hunger and starvation in Uganda Africa and across the entire world. We in Uganda experience a food desert. Very many people in Uganda are forcing their children into early forced child marriages and very many girls are falling victims of this crisis. The food deserts and poverty in Uganda are forcing children, children just like us and yours into marriages unwantedly and often with their lives threatened. When I was 13 years of age, living in Kampala, Uganda, I was to be married off. It being a fact that my family was nearly starving because we lacked food, brought about climate crisis, only the name of I happened to be the only girl and the last born. So the price of the bread would help sustain my family for some little time. But I did not want this. No, I did not. And I doubt that anyone would wish it for their children. So that caused me to think. Think so, so hard. Think so hard of what causes pollution that brings about climate crisis that has effects such as food insecurities, forcing us girl children into unwanted marriages. So I wanted to learn more. On Lighthouse Effect on our blue planet, I created a solution. And that is the climate smart urban farming solution. When I talk about climate smart urban farming, I mean a type of farming whereby we people from low income urban settings are able to grow healthy food safely using home scrapped food seeds, homemade compost, and found use containers for pots and planters that would otherwise go to our beautiful landfills. Still, as you know, I recycle products that I grow in food, such as bottles, sacks, car tires, all sorts of plastics and containers. But as I collect containers that I grow my crops in, I'm ever mindful, because some contain chemicals which are harmful to the plants and even to us human beings. So to everyone out there, as you're collecting plastics and other containers to grow in our food, let us be mindful of the containers we decide to use so that we bring about climate planet. Still, I'm also engaged in a climate smart urban farming project at my school, and that is Mienga High School here in Uganda, Kampala, alongside my peer and friend Rita. Just like me, Rita was almost becoming a child bride at the age of 15. So sad, but good news. She was inspired by what I have been doing. And she also started up the Climate Smart Urban Farming Project at her home. 
And currently with the tomatoes in the next slide that Rita has grown, she's becoming economically empowered because she's able to sell them and get money, attain an education and as well feed her family and her community. Still with climate smart urban farming, we are seeing that we are getting a, lo a lot of benefits, very many with one being climate action. We are reducing more, we are reducing of the manufacturing of more man-made materials, hence de de decreasing industrial emissions. That is the beauty of it all. Still, we are seeing that we are reducing on land and water pollution because we are planting food safely without using chemicals that would otherwise go to our water bodies. And we are reusing found containers and sacks and even cutters to grow in the land so that they don't go to the landfills. We are seeing that we are ensuring to provide proper air supply and reducing on air pollution in that we are decreasing on emissions by reusing and not buying new materials. Still, we are bringing about food, has food security. With climate smart up and farming, we are ensuring that we are growing enough food to feed our communities and are trying to solve this from a grassroots level. And that is from our families to our community, then to the entire nation and targeting the entire world. Still, we are bringing about economic empowerment since we are fighting poverty at home for individuals, for communities, and even the entire nation. Still, we are seeing that we are providing employment opportunities. As we go to school, we tend to hire people to go to the gardens and look after them. So they also get to test the importance and the beauty in climate smart urban farming, among which is employment. Nevertheless, so beautiful of it is that we are freeing girls, very many girls from first child marriages. It being a fact that we are growing food and teaching this skill to different families so that they have a solution to climate crisis, bringing food insecurities and not forcing us girls into unwanted early child marriages. We are supporting girls' education with the funds we get from climate smart urban farming, the food we grow, we sell some, and then invest in the education of a girl child. Because I believe that when you educate a girl child, you are indeed educating a nation. Still, we are promoting a green environment for the future generation because I believe that we all need a healthy planet to sustain our lives and create a space that our children will call home tomorrow. Climate smart urban farming has been proven not to be affected by any weather condition, meaning anyone anywhere can do just what I, I and Rita did. As we're seeing that it is providing very many benefits, it's even working towards nearly achieving all the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, among which is zero hunger, no poverty, quality education, gender equality, and the number one them of all them is bringing about climate action and protecting life below water. Anyone can do what I did. Despite the fact that we are getting challenges in climate smart urban farming, cause for me personally, it was not easy starting up climate smart urban farming. It being a fact that I am a girl teaching elders and men to whom this has been seen as an insult. It was not at all easy because we girls are not allowed to speak a thing when men are speaking. No, we are not even allowed to make decisions for anyone, not even ourselves. But I had to insist on, fight so hard for myself, for the girls who are looking at Latifa has hope to their lives, has a solution to the world. So I had to fight so, so hard, so hard to produce positive results that would help me convince those from my community, those from my family, and most of those from my nation, not to condemn me for being a girl, no, not to deny me an education as a girl child, and worst of them all, not to force me into a marriage I don't want, but rather to support me as I fight for my life and future. And good news, friends, it all came out well. My project produced positive results and they are helping me attract very many people to also start up this project into their different homes and communities alongside schools. Meaning that all of us can do it anywhere and anytime. All we need to do is having what? Foods, seeds, healthy soil and safe used containers for pots and planters that would otherwise go to our landfills. That is number one. 
Number two, knowing what we are fighting for. Just like me, I knew what I was fighting for, and that was one, to stop my unwanted marriage, provide food to my family, and attain an education for me and my fellow girls. To many, it may be climate action or climate justice, which we are working towards achieving. And lastly, having love for what you're doing. Because I believe when everything is done with love, everything comes out perfect. This is our time. It's time we act. Because if we delay, our future and even our kids won't have a place to call home tomorrow. Thank you so much for that. Let me welcome my fellow here, Dakota, to further bring to us more solutions that will solve international and global problems. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Latifa. Uh, you continue to inspire me. Latifa just shared an absolutely incredible solution um, in an urban setting. There are also solutions to large scale agriculture happening around the world. So how do we get our healthy soil back for us and our earth? First of all, we at Airs for Oceans acknowledge that we must grow food utilizing the practices and the principles of the indigenous peoples of the lands upon which we live. We honor and hold hands with those who have always, always known how to grow food in a safe and healthy way for all, including for other species and future generations. Today, there is a term being used extensively as we recognize that the solution is the way in which indigenous peoples grow food and that is regenerative agriculture. So regenerate means to heal what has been harmed. Humans have absolutely harmed the land we need to survive. Indigenous peoples of our lands grew food in harmony with the land, our waters and people. Earth for Oceans wants to see those traditional practices scaled widely around the world. And we want to see policy in place that mandates moving towards regenerative agriculture in harmony with the traditional ecological knowledge of indigenous peoples and with the indigenous peoples of that land. Farmers should absolutely also be supported in this transition with guidance and financial assistance if needed. So what do we want to see mandated as a solution to the dirt and climate crisis? Stop these practices. They don't further food growth and they harm important ecosystems and us. Next slide, please. Use planned animal grazing through animal husbandry practices because soil crust need to be broken down by hooves and animal manure actually acts as a natural fertilizer. And we need to grow food naturally with more than one species to support biodiversity and absolutely eliminating monoculture. And after harvest, plant cover crops to keep the soil healthy and support biodiversity. Cover crops keep carbon dioxide out of our atmosphere and in the ground. And making these changes also helps farmers. Not only will they be working in a healthier environment, but they will save money for the purchases of so many products and they will have stronger, more resilient plants that can um, stay resilient through the climate stressor, stress, stressors that plague our planet. So the moral of the story is soil is going to save us, but only if we utilize this resource in a non-destructive, harmonious way. We must work towards legislation to require and support these steps being taken. So I ask you all to please support any legislation and support us as we work with our legislative and educational initiative that has a goal to normalize healthy agricultural practices. We have work ahead of us with farmers, scientists, indigenous peoples and government officials to draft a plan that will effectively allow us to reach our goal of achieving a healthy and safe planet for our generation and future generations. Our planet can be a safe one, but only if we work with our land and work with the indigenous peoples who know our land, who know this land better than anyone else. And then our future can be a safe one. Now I'd really like to pass it off to Miguel who will talk about his solution. The problem of chemical fertilizers being used in growing food is causing communities like mine, Pescadero, California, to have poison drinking water. 
and San Mateo County has been informed for years and yet has not taken any action. Our county is one of the rich, most richest counties in America where Silicon Valley is located and there should not be a problem fixing this. I want our government to protect us and regulate the amount of chemical fertilizers used in the state of California. My generation needs to take action and solve problems such as this as they are out of hand. I want future generations to, have, to not have to worry about drinking poison water and to have a basic human right, which is to have portable water and clean and healthy waterways. Thank you. Latifa. Please, everyone out there, let us start out climate smart urban farming. Let us grow our healthy food in a healthy way and a sustainable way. Let's not use chemicals, no. Let's use rather natural fertilizers has Dakota said, from animals. We are even working towards achieving a, a global youth movement that is looking forward to ensuring that we grow food healthily and invest in things that are bringing about climate justice. We are right now paying consequences of actions that were done by our ancestors. This is the time that we should act so that our children and grandchildren do not face the same situation just like we are facing. If we don't act now, they won't have a place to call home tomorrow. Then we'll be doing bad to them. It's a matter of time and action because I believe change starts with you and me. So let us set out Climate Smart Urban Farming has a status project, then we can aim higher. We are growing food organically in healthy soils. And if we don't do that, then we'll have done them a great injustice. I believe that change starts with you and me. Every youth out there, it's our time to act. Every support out there, please invest in educational projects for youths to learn on how to bring about climate justice. And how are we going to achieve that? It's through respecting the law of nature. Grow things organically, don't apply any chemicals, and we'll see the justice the world will be receiving and a place to call home for our grandchildren and children. I remain alongside my fellow heirs, Miguel and Dakota. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Aptera for giving us the platform to air out our voices. We have youths who are to inherit the generation to come. Thank you so much, Miss and Natalia, for the kind time and the good moderation you have really given to us. As I asked our ocean, you can contact us from the websites below. That is through emails, here's to our ocean.org. WhatsApp numbers are also there. Instagram pages are also there. We are happy to be of service and thank you for amplifying our voices and for the platform up there. Educating a girl is educating a nation. Thank you so much. Welcome all questions available. Thank you so much, Mati Lativa and Dakota and Miguel. This was very informative. Uh, it's definitely a call to action. And uh, we have some great questions coming in as well. Uh, I'm inspired. I hear Dakota talk about the visual circle that the agriculture is going through. And then when you hear Miguel and Latifa, that circle is a lot larger because it is not just the vicious circle of the agricultural uh, habits, but also the impact it has on the communities where they're not either not able to have safe drinking water, which is a sort of a first that we need to have, 
and the impact even all the way to uh, what happens to the children and then specifically as uh, Latifa mentioned in Uganda where there's child marriage. So solving our problems around agriculture will in, you know, will A, help the planet, but will also help our communities to live a more healthy and safe life. So let's look at some of the great questions we came, that came in. Um, at first there was Mohan, uh, who, uh, thank you for your great presentation. And he was uh, referring to, and we have a few of those questions, around 75% of global farmland uh, is uh, used for livestock, either because the livestock is on it or before food uh, to feed the livestock. Um, so a lot of the problems that have been you know, highlighted during uh, this presentation uh, are a consequence of our diets, where, you know, meat, dairy, and egg consumption, and specifically meat, you know, impact that. Um, are, you know, uh, so the question is, um, are you working also on, on educating and, and uh, ways to see how people can change their diet uh, where they would stop eating more, uh, you know, destructive and unsustainable? sustainable foods. So yeah. who are the panelists? Okay, Dakota, go ahead. Uh, unless Latifa or Miguel, would you guys like to take this one or? Okay, I'll go for it. So um, <laughs> this is actually a great question. Um, and although this is not a part of our legislation um, in, in this initiative, always, always, uh, when we present or when we go out talking about these issues, uh, a lot of the times we do bring up the problem with the consumption of especially beef, um, as it, it, it releases so many different greenhouse gases into our atmosphere, carbon dioxide and methane. Um, so absolutely, we bring this up. Um, and I think this is a very, very great point. Thank you, Dakota. Latifa, did you want to add something to that? Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, it's true. We are still working to some extent on, let me say, getting people to reduce on how much they are consuming this food, this meat, because we do believe that too much of everything is not always good. So we want to revert people to getting more of these vegetables, which are grown organically that are healthy to their bodies so that they live healthier lives and still bring about uh, just justice to the climate and to the environment by reducing on the rate at which they over let me say graze or look after cattle but still having proper diet thank you lativa um, another great question came from um, oh. so from Shay about what are some ways uh, we can support both individual and large scale growers in transitioning towards healthy farming methods. One of the things uh, that stood out to me, Miguel, when you talked about you know the farmers are not aware even of the impact, uh, the long-term impact of the pesticides uh, they use. So I think this sort of fits with that. So Miguel, would you be willing to answer this one to say, hey, what can we do to, to help, you know, the community that might not know of that impact, you know, so they can get to healthier uh, farming methods? Well, <laughs> of course it would be great, like for us to go and talk to the farmers, like face to face, you know, but at the end of the day, it's whatever they want to do. Like, they're going to do whatever is more convenient for them. Like, it might be cheaper. They might act, because um, chemical fertilizers, like, kill the plants and everything. That's what they want. So, I don't know, maybe, like, talk to them, but then also take it to the next step and talk to legislators and maybe do something with the ban or, I don't know, something you know, high up there that would like do a, like a set a rule on chemical fertilizers 
and that hopefully will make a change. Thank you. Thank Miguel. you. I just want to add on. one. Sorry. <laughs> let's what? go. Let's do Lativa <laughs> first and then the coda. <laughs> I know there's the passion of answering this. So Lativa, you, you start. Okay. Maybe Dakota, take over because it looks like we have a, an internet problem. That we should first of all give no. Can I say, friend? Latifa, I think you broke up a little bit. Are you there? Yeah. Would you mind restating? Um, I think the Wi-Fi cut out for a bit. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, actually, I'm trying to relate to the question that has been posed. It being a fact that we, the individuals in this community or on this planet Earth, we do not know that what we do has effects on our blue planet. So I believe that we should at least, first of all, open the minds of the people in our communities. Show them the real life truth that if you, let me say, if you dump bottles on the ground, they will end up in our waterways. That if you put chemicals onto the land, they will, it will erode and go to our waterways. Let's open them to the truth. Let's start with giving them knowledge that with our actions, it's our actions that are bringing about all these consequences. Then we should tell them that if we do this and this right, we are going to get this. That if we stop throwing bottles on land and grow in them food, we are going to be bringing about climate justice. If we go for climate smart urban farming, grow in the sacks that we throw in our water bodies, food will be bringing about climate action. Have healthy food. If you want, let me say, fertilizers for your crops, then make a home compost. The remaining, the remaining food you don't want, put it in that compost pit. You will be making fertilizers at the end of the day. Apply it into the soil rather than using chemicals, which are also even going to not only harm the soil, but even harm our waterways. So I believe we should be straight and open to the community. We should put knowledge and sense to these people we are living with, because they should know that their actions are bringing about all these consequences that we are facing and tell them the life truth that if you put chemical fertilizers, they are going to affect the soil and even the waterways when it rains and erodes. And if you grow food in a sack and using manure that is organic, you can still have healthy food in healthy soils and bring about climate justice and climate action. Thank you so much. I just wanted to add on really, really fast to um, everything everyone has said. Um, I just feel like it's really, really important before any legislation happens or anything mandating um, regenerative practices or any agricultural practices, there has to be the, the discussion with the farmers and there has to be um, a certified um, and, and fortified support for those farmers. Um, we can't you know, create any legislation that's going to mandate something without communicating with the farmers um, as you know, it's their livelihood. Um, and so I just find that very, very important. That's an excellent point, uh, Dakota. Uh, and that reminds me of uh, the marine protected areas in front of the California coast. Uh, they tried this many, many times to get those established. And the last time when we did get those established, it was a joint effort with uh, everybody involved, the fishermen, uh, the, the the cities, uh, the, the 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 conservationists, uh, and just by doing it together and listening to each other uh, is how we managed to to get the marine protected areas in California. And it's been a success because it's shown to increase the livelihood for the fishermen by doing it more sustainable. So I I fully want to underscore Dakota that it, it is it is about working with each other to create a new future together. Um, so 
I saw a question, uh, Dakota, which I think is great for you. Um, because the question was from Iris and it is, do chemical fertilizers and pesticides impact marine life? In other words, does it poison fishes and further acidify the ocean waters? And one thing I didn't introduce with Dakota, she since I think, you know, about 10 years old has been very passionate about otters and, uh, and protecting uh, the otter populations, uh, specifically in California, but across the world. So she has a lot of knowledge about impact of land on the ocean. So go, you know, why don't you start? Absolutely, this is a great question. Thank you so much. Um, Yes, absolutely. Huge impacts. Um, around the world, we see an overuse of chemical fertilizers. And what happens is a lot of the times it run, runs off and the nutrients in these chemical fertilizers like nitrates and phosphorus, they, they stimulate algae in water, in lakes, in our oceans, and it causes this algae to bloom. And certain algae, when it blooms, it produces harmful toxins. So here I live in California on the Northern California coast, we have a really big problem with um, red tide or pseudonychia blooms. So pseudonychia is a diatom that when it's stimulated, uh, it blooms and produces demulk acid, which is a neurotoxin. Um, and what happens is this toxin accumulates in shellfish. So crab fisheries have been shut down but it also has killed off massive amounts of sea lions and sea otters on our coast. And we also see these toxins in Florida. There was a huge harmful algal bloom in Florida with Carina brevis blooming and the toxins were getting out into the air. So beaches were shut down and people were dealing with asthma and other respiratory um, problems. And what happens is a lot of the times these, these um, harmful algal blooms, they block the sunlight, um, and when they die and decompose, that decomposition process sucks the, water, the oxygen out of the water. So now we have what's called a hypoxic zone or a dead zone where life is absolutely killed off because the oxygen is no longer in the water. So now we have not only massive die offs from this harmful algal bloom and the toxins coming from the harmful algal bloom, but then on top of that, there's these dead zones. So absolutely, incredible amounts of issues. Um, but yeah, that was a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have uh, another great question and it's upvoted even uh, from Kenyon. Uh, uh, they are asking, uh, do you uh, hashtag honor and land and acknowledge indig indigenous stewards? So I think that one, so I think it is about, do we, do we involve, so I'm going to translate that a little bit. Do we involve the indigenous uh, population in, in um, helping create this regenerative, regenerative uh, agriculture? Let me yes. give that. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Dakota. No, absolutely. That is so, so very important. And before, um, first of all, I'd like to make an acknowledgement that I am presenting today on Rambatesh Ohlone, Ohlone land. I absolutely forgot to mention that at the beginning of my presentation, but it's so important to acknowledge that right now I am sitting on, standing on Rambatesh Ohlone land and I acknowledge that. But absolutely um, honoring native land and indigenous people stewards is so very important. Um, absolutely, thank you. Latifa, do you see that happen in Africa as well? Yeah, it does happen in Africa. We really appreciate the indigenous people in the, those people who are still really stuck on those traditional methods that are dirty with soil to produce food in a proper and healthy way. Not machines, not chemicals, but we even base more on artificial has in natural and homemade compost has manure. We don't aim for artificial fat, the natural manure that we are having. Because even we are seeing that is not toxic, that is not harmful, but it can even chase away pesticides. So you see that with the 
hands being gotten dirty, we are producing something better. So we really appreciate the land and the people who are still sticking on those, let me say, methods which are good, has been good, very good to the land. And we are saying a big no, a big, big no to people who are, let me say, mechanizing the machines. We are saying no. Yeah, it's still a journey, but we are saying no. Yeah. Thank you, Lativa. Um, with a, a focus, this, this leads straight into it, um, and is by an anonymous and uh, attendee. Uh, there, he, uh, he or she, sorry, or they <laughs> responded to uh, the the regenerative agriculture and the role that uh, animals, grazing animals, play into that. Uh, there is a study apparently from Oxford University uh, for grazed and confused, where they they uh, where there is a, they say there is uh, there is not uh, the grazing livestock is not a climate solution. So I guess the question here is more around. This could be a transition period, right, from from grazing livestock. So, your uh, let me turn this into a question: How would you know grazing livestock? Yes or no? Or the fact that this might not be beneficial? How do you see their role uh, in the transition to regenerative uh, agriculture? And who wants to take this one? Maybe Latifa, because I think it was during your, okay. you know, uh, presentation. And it's, of course, it's also different in which country we are with our background. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you so much for the wonderful question. Actually, uh, grazing livestock is a good solution to climate crisis or even to, cli to climate problems. How? Here in Uganda, we are seeing that we are not using cars. We are not using cars. Let me say to till the land in case it's needed. No. But we are using these animals. Let me say the oxen to bring about this method with their hooves. They are properly digesting the land to has it mix all the carbonates are going to further has it make the land stuck and hard to make it dirt. But we are getting these animals to do, to do the work because with them, they can be disposing of their wastes in the land and at the same time binding the land to make proper decomposition of the manure alongside the land. So we are seeing that the livestock rearing or even grazing in Africa, in Uganda in particular, is a climate solution. That is where I am coming from. So I stand firmly saying that indeed it is a solution for us, and I believe it can also work for everyone outside there and even across the entire world. Because I believe that if a cow disposes of manure into the ground, it needs to be mixed with the soil and with its, its hooves, it can also do that as it's moving and mixing the soil or even turning the soil. So I believe that once we rear this livestock, let me say graze it, it is acting as a good solution to climate injustices. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I think this is great, right? This is great for heirs of our ocean because it's a global movement. So it shows uh, the different aspects in different areas because it's fascinating to think, you know, to see a research and, and the person did offer us to send something. So please do send more information at info at uh, airs to our oceans, uh, dot org, uh, because I think this is great. This is a good discussion to have, uh, because when you look at, at uh, CO2, uh, if you do it very naturally as in, uh, as in Africa, you are not using machinery and you're not using oil and you're not using gas to run all this and you're not using those fertilizers. So it's like, if you look at the full footprint as you're saying, Lativa, it, it is for you know, you know they are for sure a solution. But it would be interesting to also expand that to other places in the world. So I think these are the questions and these are the conversations we need to have on our way to regenerative uh, agriculture. Uh, so thank you for that question. Uh, Patty has a question, uh, talking or really 
is saying uh, as a is saying a kudos here for mentioning composting as a way to create healthy soils and reducing food waste going into landfills. And I live in the middle of uh, uh, of San Francisco, and so I, I I'm going to turn this into a question because it's hard for me to compost. I don't, as you can see, I'm just having in a, an apartment building, <laughs> so no greenery. So how can we again get the support? I do have a composter, but then it goes into the trash, which is sort of, you know, weird. So how can we help the community to do exactly that and say, you know, find more healthier ways and, and give pathways for those that really want to, but even get more of the, you know, people to really want to uh, get to this regenerative, but they live in cities. Does any of you have recommendations there or have thought about, uh, you know, how city folk like me uh, can help the movement? Yes, please. Thank you so much for that wonderful question. Uh, actually, that is very simple. Anyone living in, in an urban setting, just like me, because I can relate to that situation, it being a fact that I live in an urban setting where land is scarce. So we try to use the available materials. Remember, we talked of pollution coming from plastics and different containers. And we do believe that everyone feeds on a daily basis, not so? So in your feeding, I do believe that not always you finish the food that you put on the plate to eat. So you can get these containers or these buckets or bowels or even dishes. Keep on disposing things that you have not finished on the plate. The food that you have not finished on the plate, keep putting it there. If today, let me say you eat meat and you have not, let me say, finished it, put it there. Tomorrow you eat some veggies, put them there. And I do believe that some of us who live in the urban setting, we also have trees that keep on littering leaves down. As you clean your compounds, you can also get those leaves, put them there, okay? You will give it one week. One week, I do believe it will have decomposed. Then after that, in case you have a garden, just pour into the, your soil. Keep pouring that mixture or that compost into your soil and let the soil work out naturally, decompose naturally, mix up naturally so that it gains its fertility from the homemade compost you have just made. So it's a matter of, of just keeping to pour in those things, pour in everything that you don't want, pour in everything like food that you don't want. Give it one week or even two weeks, any period that you want. It will have made good compost and good manure than to revert to anything like chemical treatment. So that is what is working for me in an urban setting here in Uganda. And I believe it can work for you everywhere you are. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, this is a question that's definitely should be dear and, and near to your heart. And I'm gonna uh, probably give it to Dakota first, because it's about, you know, first of all, I compliment what an amazing panel it's like you know and i thank you for all the information you've shared and um the question is what do you think are the most important things you have to learn in order to take these issues that you've discussed here today and become a power to implement some of the solutions dakota as the founder of air Zero ocean why don't you uh, kick off the answering round this is a great, great question. Thank you so much to whoever submitted this. Um, something that we believe is really, really important here in Airstra Oceans that I shared a little bit about earlier is absolutely education um, and um, providing youth with important information and helping them develop skills. So what's super important is that in these education systems, youth are, are given the information about the real world issues that we're going to face um, as we grow up and as we um, become older uh, and what we have to face right now. Uh, we should, all kids should be learning about climate change and harmful agricultural practices. But at the same time, should also be developing these critical thinking skills and teachers and educators should, should be providing youth space to, to think about these solutions, to process it, because youth have so much um, ability to connect the dots and, and really be processing this. So it's so important to give space and make space 
for um, youth to have um, critical thinking time and to process all of these issues while also provide them uh, with important and critical information. Thank you. Thank you, Dakota. Um, I have one question uh, due to time. We have one last question, uh, time for one last question. I would like to hear from you. Uh, so this is specifically also uh, because uh, Latifa has told us a lot about what she is doing and her community are doing in Uganda uh, to get to this uh, regenerative uh, agriculture. Uh, so this question is from Cumbria. And she is wondering what action have we taken here in California, right? Because California is, is feeds both uh, the US and, and a lot of the world, like 40% of the, the foods, uh, the, the vegetables and fruits come from California in the United States. So if we can get an impact here, uh, we have a major impact with that much agricultural uh, practices. Uh, so what have we done in, uh, you know, through Air to Our Oceans in California? Either Miguel or Dakota, who wants to go first? Miguel, maybe? No. As a local, in the local area of the heart of one of our uh, agriculture areas. Well, when we used to do in-person things, I would present a lot to schools, to, com to the community, you know? now that we're in a pandemic it's more online and to stay at, like i presented right now um but overall in what we do in california um we have a leadership group that does a lot of action items on how to, to reach out to legislators and to do a lot of um how do i say it? like set like zoom meetings with them but then also the the elections came up and so we kind of like set off that because there was maybe we we're not going to get the same attention as if it weren't for the elections um what else i think dakota could talk more because <laughs> i'm a little nervous <laughs> yeah that was great miguel uh just to add on to everything you said um, we've definitely been working in the legislative field. So we worked with the Ocean Protection Council and their MPA um, team. We made public comments. We made written comments on their five-year strategic plan, asking them to uh, really focus on also um, these harmful agricultural practices that are absolutely destroying our world because we didn't see enough of that in their plan. Uh, we've also almost every year spoke to California lawmakers about uh, chemical fertilizers and about the issue of overusing chemical fertilizers. And we um, spoke with um, Congresswoman Jackie Speer um, about uh, this harmful overuse of chemical fertilizers and what it's doing to com communities like the one that Miguel is in and what it's doing to our planet. And right now we are working in bringing together youth from around the world to f continue and, and broaden our reach further from just chemical fertilizers onto all harmful agricultural practices. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank uh, both, of course, the panel, Dakota, Lativa, all the way from Africa, Miguel, uh, for great information today. Uh, I want to thank also our attendees for our participants for your great questions and, and you know, uh, and, and questions for thought. Uh, so I really appreciate that. And I know the panel appreciates it. Uh, again, if you have ideas, if you want to join uh you know in in helping with this you know movement uh please contact airs to our oceans at uh info at airs to our oceans dot org uh so together we can create a regenerative world um thank you and there's robbie uh, to close uh, the panel again thank you everyone for attending as well as our amazing keynote speakers and our moderator for today 
Um, this again was our final lecture for our fall 2020 series. We will have a spring 2020 series that we will announce sometime soon. This event was recorded, so if you would like to rewatch this, we will be sending you a recording and a follow-up email, as well as relevant links, so you can stay up to date with Air Star Ocean's work. Thank you again, and have a wonderful day. Take care. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.